guys, welcome back to the channel, Daughter of Increase. My name is Nate Denise. For those of you who are new to the channel or who just happened to stumble across this video, and today's video is going to be part four of our Gospel According to John Bible study. We are still on chapter one. Today's goal is to get from verse 29, hopefully, to about, let's see, verse 42, which is on this side over here. So I'm hoping to get through basically two paragraphs today. Um, I did go ahead and add a second sheet of paper in between because I knew it was going to be a lot of notes. And I put all my sticky notes from part two on the back of this sheet. But, um, yes. So I'm going to quickly start my timer. So I have my timer going. And I am going to quickly put us in before I begin anything else. Lord, we want to know your will for our lives. Enlighten us with wisdom, discernment, and understanding. We need to know when to stay and when to go, when to speak and when to close our mouths. Fill us with the knowledge of your best for us, right now and in the future. As we seek to follow you, help us to obediently and joyfully accept your answers. Amen. So, I pray this in. Quick, simple prayer. Um, and Okay, so I have a post-it for today, and I'm going to be using this one here. Um, this is the one that I showed in part two video that I got from Tanya. I didn't get a chance to use it, so I'm going to use it for today. Now, I want to use my Zebra or Zebra F301 ballpoint. But I think it's running out of ink. <laughs> so I'm just going to go with the Micron 01 Pigma. Or Pigma Micron 01. It's a .25 millimeter pen. If you guys can see that right there. It's just black ink. Um, I do have, obviously, Super Tips, uh, Crayola Twistable Colored Pencils, Zebra Mount Liners, and the Sharpie uh, Smear Guard Highlighters as well I was gonna try to use my new um, Sharpie art pens that I got in the mail I was gonna try to use these today but um, we're not <laughs> we're just not going to again all of the notes are online um, in the Facebook group if you don't have Facebook or you um, yeah, basically if you don't have Facebook or use Facebook let me know um, and I can send you a separate link to download all of the notes. I don't want to openly tell people where the notes are just because I don't want people just to take the notes. And um, I don't know what the word is, but you know, I really worked hard on the notes, so I just want to keep it for those who are actually active with following the Bible study. Um, so if you don't have Facebook, let me know. Um, but all the notes are on Facebook, the whole complete chapter one notes for the whole 52 verses. So we're going to start off with verses 29 and 34, and I'm going to quickly read it through. And let me just see if there's anything that I had to define. Now, there's nothing I need to define until we get to the next paragraph, so... All right, just reading through. The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he whom I said after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove. It remained. Oh, I'm sorry. I saw a spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remains on him. He on whom you see the spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. So, as we studied in the last um, session, part three. Um, verses 19 and 28 is all about the testimony of John the Baptist, and this is just the continuation of his testimony. So this is really just one testimony, but um, this is when he begins to call Jesus the name of God. So now we know Jesus as the Word, we know him as the true light, 
Um, we know him as the life. And now we know him as the Lamb of God. So we have, you know, multiple different names that he is called. I'm going to try to use this pen and see if it works. But uh, if it doesn't, sorry. All right. So starting off, I'm going to underline the Lamb of God. I'm also going to underline who takes away the sin of the world. Okay, I think this pen is officially out. No, it's not. Like, the pen is writing here, so I'm not sure what's going on alrighty then so the Lamb of God basically John the Baptist tells us that Christ is going to be the ultimate sacrifice though no one really knows this what he's saying but we today in our time understand that Jesus is obviously the ultimate sacrifice um, so him being the Lamb of God already foreshadows his sacrificial um or his sacrifice on the cross i mean so and i do have cross references for that i'm going to write all right i'm going to put this pen up and i'm going to use the micron because i don't need to have this causing some issues so And I said I was going to print out my notes in the last session, and I did not. So, for part five, I will have my notes. I keep forgetting, so I'm going to actually do that today. So, um, terrible handwriting, but John the Baptist tells us that Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. I'm going to go on with this pretty green. I'm just obsessed with this green color. It's so pretty. I'm also going to put the cross references over here. So, verse 29, we have Exodus 12 and 3. Isaiah. 53 and 7 Acts 8 and 32 and 1st Peter 119 so Exodus 12 and 3 Isaiah 53 and 7 Acts 32 I'm sorry 832 and then First Peter 1 and 19. So obviously we're going to flip to those. So let's go back to the beginning to Exodus. Exodus 12 and 3. I'm trying to get it so you guys can see. Here we go. So 12 and 3 talks about the Passover lamb. Um, basically, tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, um, a lamb for a household. And it basically talks about uh, how the lamb has to be without a blemish, a male, a year old, and how they have to sacrifice that lamb. Okay. 
keep in mind it's a lamb that is without blemish and that's exactly what Jesus was he was the sacrificial lamb he had no sin he was perfect in every single way so he was without blemish and his blood shed for us um, then we have Isaiah 53 and 7 He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb laid to a, I'm sorry, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So it's basically talking about Jesus um, being the lamb that was led to his slaughter. He basically had to carry and bear his own cross. He walked along the path to get killed on the cross. Um, and he said nothing about it. Acts 8 and 32. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before his shearer is silent. So he opens not his mouth. Basically that's referencing back to Isaiah 53 and um, 8. That I just read. I'm sorry, 53.7. And we have 1 Peter 1.19. But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. So... I just thought that was interesting to know um, concerning him being the Lamb of God. But moving on, <laughs> who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist declares the destiny of Christ. He foreshadows his death and resurrection for the sins of man. Okay. okay. And I have cross references for that. I probably should have wrote that down first. But I'll write it over here. First John two two First John three five and again we have the Apostle John proving himself with the word first John four and fourteen and then Hebrews ten and twelve And I'm going to use my phone to read those scriptures to you because flipping back and forth in the Bible is a little much. So I'm just using the Holy Bible app. Um, and I guess you could see the plan that I'm currently doing. 
But um, I like the New King James translation, but I'm going to switch it to the ESV since that's the Bible we're using. Oh, and I forgot to mention, this is the ESV translation, sorry guys, um, that I use when I am doing these Bible studies. So. I'm sorry, it's not that. We're going to go to 1 John 2 and 2. And it says, He is appropriation for our sins, not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Then we have 3-5. You know that he appeared in order to take away the sins. In him there is no sin. We have 4 and 14. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the whole world. And then the last one is Hebrews 10, 12. But when Christ had offered... Yeah, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. So, that's just all talking about him being the one who takes away sin. Moving on to verse 30, it says, This is he of whom I said, after, he comes a, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. Basically, um, John was born before Jesus, but he knew and understood the pre-existence of Jesus. He knew that Jesus was eternal and everlasting. Um, so that kind of goes back into the previous verse. Uh, where is it? Um, we just read it like... <laughs> the last few sessions that was verse 15 so basically for verse 30 I would just say go and look at um, verse 15 notes and if you guys didn't see that so verse 15 is here it says uh, he come he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me basically and I wrote John the Baptist was physically born first and had his ministry first but he understood the power and pre-existence of Jesus there we go. I'm not even going to underline that, but you can see that in the notes if you have the notes. Moving to verse 31. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. Um, basically, he came to God and revealed Christ to the people. I mean, that's really as simple as it can be put. Um, he came to do the purpose, which was seen back in verse 6 of chapter 1. I don't know why it's looking a little... Okay. It says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. So... Okay, that's messages and messages. So, yeah. It basically goes back into verse 6. So, as you can see, a lot of the stuff is kind of repeating itself with this testimony. But, um, I'm not going to write those notes out. Again, they are on the printable. So, if you do want to actually write those notes, definitely check the printable. Um, join the group. The links are down below. But, um... I'm not going to um, write it out just because I don't have space. <laughs> but it's pretty much verse 30, go back to verse 15. And for verse 31, just go back to verses 6 through 8 to really know um, what that is basically saying. So moving on to verse 32. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove. And it remains on him. So basically the part where he said, I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove. Um, pretty much the Holy Spirit was shaped like a dove. That's as simple as it can be put. <laughs> and the part where it said it remained on him. The Holy Spirit did not just sit and leave. It stayed with Christ, giving him power and authority. So 
I am going to underline that part where it said it remained on him. Because I think that part is crucial. Um, that in itself has its own kind of thought process, thought process, thought to it. So, the right at the edge it's like it doesn't do the best for me <laughs> when I have to write on the edge the Holy Spirit This looks like chicken scratch, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, the Holy Spirit did not sit and leave. It stayed with him, giving power and authority. That is real chicken scratch. <laughs> References I have for that are Isaiah, what is it, 52? Oh, sorry. Isaiah 11 and 2. Matthew 3 and 16. Mark 1 10. Luke. 322 and X So, going to Isaiah 11 and 2, right? Yes, Isaiah 11 and 2. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit in counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Matthew 3.16 And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Mark 1 and 10. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. Luke 3 and 22. I'm sorry, I don't know if I hit 3. Yes, and 22. And the Holy Spirit descending on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. And finally we have Acts 10 and 38. 
how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So, this is basically just talking about um, how the Holy Spirit descended, rested on him, and gave him power and authority to do the work of God, obviously. Or, right. Thirty three says, I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So, I'm going to underline this part here. In verse 33 because basically God gave John the Baptist a sure sign to know the Messiah he confirmed his evidence from God which means that this has made him a reliable witness regarding um, Jesus I'm going to have to write on a sticky note. This is verse 33. And I'm going to use a Sharpie pen for that. Sorry guys, give me one second. I just want to fix my computer screen. So like I said, uh, verse 33, God gave John the Baptist a sure sign To know the Messiah. He confirmed. This evidence. from God which makes him a reliable witness regarding Jesus um, so again Verse 33 where it says, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Basically, God gave him, John the Baptist, a sure sign to know the Messiah. He confirmed this evidence from God, which makes him a reliable witness regarding Jesus. Cross references I have for that are Matthew 3.11, Mark 1.8, just the Gospels in general. Mark 1, 8, Luke 3, 16, and Acts 1 and 5. So, okay, 
going to Matthew 3.11. So it says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Mark 1 and 8 says, I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And um, I'm going to go straight to Acts. I'm going to skip over Luke's. Luke's. I'm going to skip over Luke and go straight to Acts. For, but for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Um, and then we go to 34, which says, I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Um, basically, John the Baptist's testimony ends with the emphasis of him being the witness as God purposed him to be. Um, and it's also telling us that Jesus is the one who perfectly declares the nature and personality of God the Father. This is um, John the Baptist's testimony of Jesus as Christ. So, I'm going to actually underline, this is the Son of God. And I have seen and borne witness. So. I have seen and borne witness. And this is the Son of God. Okay, so, again, I have seen and bore witness, basically, John the Baptist was um, the witness to Jesus as God purposed him to be, and this is the Son of God, this is his confession as Jesus as Christ. So that's it for this lovely paragraph, I'm actually going to stick this note somewhere. I don't know. When you have so many sticky notes and don't know what to do, so you have to rearrange them. <laughs> okay. Stick you up here. Stick you here. And now we are moving on. To the second paragraph that I wanted to do. Let me actually close this up quickly, my notes, okay. We're on good timing. We can actually probably finish all of chapter one today, you guys. Pray if we fingers crossed and then we can dive into chapter two on Tuesday. <laughs> so, okay. So this is called, Jesus calls the first disciples. Um, so we're now at the part where we're about to get three more different testimonies 
from his soon to be disciples. Um, so starting off with 35, the next day again, John was standing with his two, di I'm sorry. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, John being John the Baptist, not John the Apostle. Um, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was the tenth hour. It was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, this means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So a lot just took place <laughs> in this paragraph. Um, basically, John the Baptist has two disciples. Um, and... I'm sorry. Yeah, so John the Baptist basically has two disciples, and he sees Jesus walking past, so he says, Behold, this is the Lamb of God. So his two disciples, there must be, there has to be something in the spirit that allows them to um, walk away from the one that they followed to now follow Jesus Christ. Um, they're calling Jesus teacher, of course. They know who he, they, they don't know who he is, but they are aware of who he is from their kind of teacher, which would be John the Baptist. Um, Jesus tells them to come, they follow him. One of those are Andrew, which is Peter's brother. So we also see evidence of the first person kind of like bringing someone to Christ. Um, Andrew looks for his brother, brings him to Jesus, and Jesus then renames Simon into Peter. So let's actually break all this down now, okay? <laughs> Let's break it all down, but we are going to start with a lovely cross-references, I mean not cross-references, definitions. So I have disciples circled. Behold, Andrew, Simon, and Peter. Yes. So, disciples behold... Andrew, Simon, and Peter are the words that I have to circle that I want to define. So, starting with disciples. So the Greek word is, I don't know how to pronounce that, but um, it basically means a learner or pupil. Then we have behold. The Greek word for that is haro. which means to to see perceive a 
tend to experience discern look upon okay let's do some color quickly Another post it. That's not the one. <laughs> Clearly. So, Andrew, Andrew. It just means manly. That's pretty much all that Andrew means. Simon. Now, Simon means um, doubtful. It's a Hebrew name. I've heard um, from other people that it means wavering, which would also be true if you're doubtful, you do waver in your decisions. So, um,. Last word is Peter. And it means stone, boulder, or rock. Which I also knew that, that um, he changed his name from doubt to rock. Which makes sense if you really think about it. But, um... Andrew. Let's get this gorgeous gray for Simon. And Peter. Okay, so we're only at an hour and 18 minutes, so we're doing good, we're doing good. Um, okay, got that out the way. Let's scroll back to the notes that I need. Okay, so the next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples. So, John was standing with two of his disciples. And those two disciples were John, the disciple, and um, Andrew, which was Simon Peter's, Simon Peter's brother. So, I'm going to say... Okay. So John was standing with two of his disciples. Those two disciples were both John, um, his cousin, and Andrew. Then he says, I'm going to go to 36, where he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Use a sharpie. Okay. 
basically behold the lamb of god john the baptist once again calls out who jesus is and um it's important that he says it so that man would know so basically shortly put john the baptist declares Who Jesus is and his purpose because once you say the Lamb of God we know that the lambs people know that lambs are sacrificed so and we know that he is the son of God because he said Lamb of God so we know that he's a sacrificial son that God sent to the earth to die for our sins to take away sin to save us and reconcile us back to God. That was terrible, but whatever. Moving to 37. It says, uh, I'm going to underline, heard him say this, they followed Jesus. And I'm going to use, no, because I already have blue there. We're going to use orange. So I just keep looking at my screen to make sure everything um, is still recording since I have it casting to my computer as I do this. So, okay guys, so the camera had cut off because <laughs> I needed to just restart the recording. But um, what I was saying for Behold the Lamb of God, I basically put that John the Baptist declares who Jesus is and his purpose just from that name. And then in verse 37, I underline, heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. So I already prepared my notes over here, verse 37. So let me open this up over here. I didn't mean to close that, but whatever. Oh, and let's start the timer back up. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so we were at an hour and 12 minutes. Resuming it. Basically, John and Andrew went after Jesus to become his disciples after hearing the words of John the Baptist. So his testimony and witness of who Jesus was encouraged these two to want to now be followers of Jesus Christ. So, um, like I was saying, John and Andrew went after Jesus to become his disciples after hearing the testimony from John the Baptist. This proves that um, a testimony can really pull someone to, to Christ. It can really pull someone to God and save their lives. So I think that's very key and important to realize. Put my computer on mute. And I'm actually going to write that. A test. 
testimony can save a soul. Okay. So moving on to 38. Um, down to where it says, what are you seeking? This is basically a logical and important question that we as followers of Christ truly need to ask ourselves daily. So this should be something that we ask daily. So this isn't some type of like theological note or like profound note. This is just something I feel like we as Christians really need to ask ourselves daily. What are we seeking? Are we seeking um, those, those things of God? Are we seeking the kingdom of God? Are we seeking to save a soul and bring a soul um, to Christ? Like what is it that you're seeking on a daily basis? Because I know in a world that we live in, a fast-paced world where everything is like a microwave, um, we're so used to instant gratification. We're so used to things being about us. But as Christians, we don't need to be thinking about ourselves. And I'm sorry, my mic isn't in the phone. I'm sorry, in the camera. So hopefully this sounds better <laughs> um, now that I have the mic attached to it. I thought I put it back in, but I didn't. But um. Yeah, we as Christians really need to be thinking about those things of God, those things that are pure, true, just, and stuff like that. Um, so, I just feel like that's a profound question to, to really ask ourselves, you know, what it is that we are seeking. Rabbi, which means teacher, I would say highlight that. So I am going to um, mark that, but I don't have to actually write it down because obviously the definition is there. So rabbi, which means teacher, that's pretty much it. All you have to highlight for that, and that's in verse 38. Um, moving to verse 39. He said to them, come and you will see. So, five words, but it has a lot of meaning to it. Basically, Jesus gives us direction to him, and I'm sorry, Jesus gives us direction to him to abide in him for what we seek. So, when I'm asking myself, you know, what it is that I'm seeking on a daily basis, Jesus is already telling me, come and I will see, but I'm not going to see what it is that I truly want. I'm going to see what it is that God desires for me. Um... So, Jesus gives, and the reason why I'm saying I'm going to see what God desires for me is because over time as a Christian, your desires will no longer be your own. Um, your desires should align with God's desires. So, that's why the Bible says that he'll give you your desire, your heart's desire. Um, it's because if you're a Christian and a follower of Christ, your desires will not be what you thought they were. They would ultimately be aligned with those desires that God have, those desires that Jesus have. So
go into verse 40. One of the two who had heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So basically, Andrew was the first disciple of the twelve. <laughs> That is verse 40. Andrew was the first disciple. references for that are Matthews 4 18 to 22 Mark 1 16 to 20 and then Luke 5 2 through 11 and obviously we're going to read those so Matthews 4, 18 to 22. So it says, while, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat was Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So you have first Andrew and then Simon Peter. Then you have John and James. So Andrew was one of the first disciples. Um, I'm also going to read Mark one sixteen to 20. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. I'm just trying to get this in frame. For they were fishermen, and Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. Um, and then he goes into John and um, James, the sons of Zebedee. We have Luke. I mean, it's pretty much repetitive what it's saying. So Luke 5, 2 through 11, I'm not going to read all of it, but he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put it out a little from the land. Um, I'm trying to find that specific verse so that I don't have to continue reading it so long. Okay, basically you can just read 5, um, verse 2 through 11, but this more so is all about Peter instead of Andrew, but Andrew was the first disciple. Okay. Going to verse 41. I just dropped the top to my mic on. get my chair comfortable so 41 he first found his own brother Simon I'm going to underline that we found the Messiah I'm also going to underline we have found the Messiah but then I'm going to also double underline Messiah which means Christ because that in itself is a definition
So, he first found his brother Simon. Messiah, which means Christ. have found the Messiah. So for where he says, um, where it says he first found his own brother Simon, this um, is an example of a fisher of men. He sought his own brother out to bring, I'm sorry, he sought his own brother out first to bring him to Christ. So um, it's kind of like a reminder that we need to work in our homes first within our families and bring our families to Christ. Um, which I think is amazing because he's the first person to actually pull someone into Christ outside of, obviously, John the Baptist. John the Baptist had a specific purpose that God created him for. He was birthed to be the um, light that introduced the, the true light. Whereas Andrew was a disciple of john the baptist who now turned into a disciple of jesus christ but he was a fisherman if you all paid attention when i read um the matthews mark and luke verses and um yeah he was basically a fisherman who then fished out his own brother to be pulled into christ hopefully that made sense you guys know you know most of the time things make sense in my head when i say them out loud they sound weird <laughs> um but i'm gonna put my note over here so that's 41 right yes so so it says his he first found his own brother simon andrew is an example of a fisher of men He saw his own brother out first, sought his own brother out first to bring him to Christ. And then that second part where I said, we have found the Messiah. This is a testimony of the expected Savior of Israel and the world. So, testimony from Andrew of the expected Savior of Israel. So the first testimony we had came from John the Baptist. Now the second one comes from his first disciple, Andrew. Going on to verse 42. He brought him to Jesus. I'm going to underline that. I'm going to skip ahead to you are Simon, the son of John. Then I'm going to also underline you shall be called Cephas. I'm going to double underline Cephas, which means Peter, because again, that's a two parter. So I'm going to take. Sorry about that noise, you guys. I do have my um, my fruits out. My, my cherries so that's the bag of cherries you just heard but um Cephas which means Peter I'm gonna underline in yellow I 
feel like I need to go open up my other pack of Crayola Twistables. The Brought in the Jesus is one color. So, he brought him to Jesus. And I'm going to pose this part as a question because I think it's a very important question to ask ourselves. So, um, again, this is one of those... Okay, let me move my um, fruits quickly. So that's not in the way of making noise. But um, I'm going to pose this as a question because I think it's important. So he, it says that he brought him to Jesus. So the question I have is, do we eagerly bring people to Christ with the right heart and a testimony of who he is? And I want you to actually think about that because I think that's a question that not a lot of us don't answer. Most people go to church and they feel like um, everything is a duty and a chore. So, you know, praying, check mark. I Bible studied, check mark. Um, I bought someone, you know, saved a soul, check mark. But are you eager to do those things? Are you eager to really bring someone to Christ? Are you telling them how Christ has worked in your life? Are you telling them how God saved you? Are you telling them, you know, your testimony? And there's not just one testimony. We all have thousands of testimonies. I mean, every day there's a testimony. Every day we are um, witnessing something new that Jesus is doing in our lives, that God is doing for someone that we know. So you can technically testify every day, but a lot of us... Um, I know for me, I grew up thinking that a testimony was something like that was profound, like you were in like the biggest rut of your life and boom, pow, you know, you got out of that. But I learned um, at my church I'm at now that that's not always the case. A testimony can be as simple as passing a test. A testimony can be as simple as crossing the street because most people don't can't just cross the street. Some people get hit by cars. Um, a testimony could be. You came back in your house. Not everyone goes back into their homes because people are out here dying. Like, anything can be a testimony. That you ate your food without choking. That's a testimony in itself. And it sounds weird. Some people might laugh while I'm saying this. But it's the truth. A testimony can be anything that you see. I can read. I can share that as a testimony. Not many people can do that. Some people don't have the privilege. Being able to read this right here, this word of God, this word that was inspired by him, that in itself is a testimony. I mean, not many people have the privilege. Some people get killed for this, for, for just touching or looking at the Holy Bible. Like, you know, so everything is a testimony. You just have to think about it. So that's the question that I basically wrote down. Do we eagerly bring people to Christ with the right heart and a testimony of who he is? And when I say a right heart, again, I mean with um true intention not just bringing them to christ because that's what we're told to do that's what we're supposed to do because i've met some people who have nasty attitudes who try to bring other people into christ and um it just it never works out that way like ever so you know do we eagerly bring people to christ eagerly Bring people to Christ with a right heart and a testimony. Of who he is, who he is. That's that's the question. It's as simple as that. Do we eagerly bring people to Christ with the right heart and a testimony of who he is? So then it says, "You are the son of Simon." I'm sorry. You are Simon, the son of John. Um, is the other part that I underlined. So. Jesus knows us better than we know ourselves. It's as simple as that. Jesus knows us better 
better than we know ourselves. And then the last part for verse 42 is when I underlined, um, you shall be called Cephas. Oh, okay, so I do have to go back. <laughs> so I'm going to go back here and where it says, um, which means Peter. I'm also going to double underline that. And I'm going to underline it with purple. Nope. I'm going to use a twistable. <laughs> I'm going to use this orangey color. Because I did have a point for that. I just forgot. So. Let's mark my paper. Okay, so this is the part that says, You shall be called Cephas. Um... Jesus gave Simon a new name, which foreshadowed who he would become. Um, though his name was Simon now, Jesus didn't look at him and see who he was right now. He saw what he would become. Um, sorry about the hand motions, uh, but I think that's profound because a lot of us tend to look at ourselves and we see who we are now or who we were in the past. And that's not how God looks at us or how Jesus looks at us. They look at us and see who we will become Um in them if that makes sense so who who we will become in christ and in god not the person we were prior to them or the person who's gonna make mistakes because they understand thankfully through jesus christ coming to dwell on earth with us and be amongst humans um they understand that we're, we will fail it's as simple as that um there's no way to avoid it we will fail we will suffer and we will fail we will sin we will do right we will do wrong we'll be we'll do just things we'll do unjust things it's just the way that we are created um and because of the whole fall with Adam and Eve. But in spite of that, when they look at us, they don't see who we are or who we were. They see us for who we are going to become, which I think is so good. And I honestly wish someone would have told me that years ago. I've been saved all my um I've been saved since I think ten. Um, but I've been in church all of my life. And even though I've always been in church, and I mean, I was active in church, dance ministry, choir, um, going to Bible studies every Wednesday, going to choir rehearsals every Thursday, dance practices every Friday. I was active with you, church, um, being an usher and stuff like that. Like, I was truly active, and, um, you know, I enjoy, I've always loved Bible study, but I had gone through things, and I had did some things that I weren't, wasn't proud of and things that I felt like should not have happened to me. And um, I would hold that against myself and like kind of like, you know, how you hold a grudge against someone, but I was actually holding that grudge against myself. And that was preventing me from seeing the person that I would become. And I mean, you guys, when I say it took me years to get out of depression, I've been depressed since um, the third or fourth grade, third or fourth grade. Um, I don't even know how old you have to be at that time, about like eight, seven. I'm going to say seven, eight. I've been depressed. I am now 27. Um, and I got out of depression about a year or two years ago. So it literally took me almost 20 years. Um, and mainly because I was holding grudges against myself and dealing with a lot. But if I would have knew that the past was the past and that the way God looks at me is not the way I look at myself, life would have been so much easier. Like, I'm just saying, it would have been so much easier. But anyway... Um, <laughs> you shall be called Cephas. So, Jesus gave Simon a new name, which foreshadowed Who he would become and the key word in that is would become not should become could become like this is who Simon will become he will become a key factor um, which then goes into the second part which I'm gonna get to but the cross references I have for that are 1st Corinthians
1 in 12, and also 3 in 22. So, first one thing is 1 in 12. I will get to right now. First Corinthians. What is that? 1 in 12. It says, What I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And then we have 3.22, right? Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. So, no matter what you call yourself, who you call yourself, I mean, Cephas, we know Cephas is um, Peter, who was Simon. Paul was Saul. I'm not really sure who Apollos is. I, I can't tell you. Oh, sorry. I can't tell you who Apollos is. I'm, you know, I'm not that well versed. Like, I know the word, but I don't know the word, if that makes sense. Like, I can tell you a scripture, but I can't tell you where the scripture is from. It's insane, but I'm working on that. But, um, you know, these are people who had different names but now had something new um and if you want even an old testament um example of that you have um <laughs> abram which was he was called abraham and then you had sarai but she was called sarah and um you know their names foreshadowed who they would become i think sarai means my princess Whereas Sarah means princess. So Sarai meaning my princess. She's just the princess of one. But um, because God promised that they would have many nations, he changed her name to Sarah, which means princess. A princess is a nation over many. I mean, she's a princess over many instead of being my princess, which is over one. So it's stuff like that where um, you can see the, the changes that are going to be happening in life that are really profound. Um, moving on back to this where it says, which means Peter. I'm basically saying that Peter would be a stone of stability for Jesus, um, a foundation of the church. I'm not even going to say for Jesus, so I probably need to edit that. Peter would be a stone of stability and a foundation of the church. There we go. And the cross reference I have for that, I will show you. Okay, so Peter would be a stone of stability and a foundation of the church, Matthew 16 and 8, which I already flipped to. Um, and it says, I tell you, you are Peter. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, Peter on this rock. So, as it, like I said, Peter means rock, boulder, or stone. So, he was really crucial with... Um, starting the church so that is it for that paragraph and I think yes yes all right we still have 40 minutes left so I'm going to tackle 40 minutes guys I'm gonna tackle this last paragraph and then we can start on chapter 2 on Tuesday so excited so it says Jesus calls Philip and Nathaniel, so this is his next few um, disciples. I'm going to read that and just going back to my definitions.
Okay, so reading through from 43 to 51. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses is Sorry, of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Verse 50. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Last verse, 51. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So that is it. So I'm going to now circle my words so first I circled Galilee then I did found where is it Philip I circled I'll circle this one here Philip Bethsaida We have Nathaniel, Nazareth, and then Deceit. So Galilee found Philip, Bethsaida, Nathaniel, Nazareth, and Deceit are the only words that I wanted to define from the last paragraph. And I'm probably just going to extend this session just so that I can complete all of chapter one since I'm already starting and we're 37 minutes left. So Galilee, first of all, we need color. We need we need color in our lives because color just makes everything better. I'm gonna use Nazareth with this green. Sorry about my arm being in the way, guys. I should move these over here. Deceits. Okay. Just needs to get the color on my page. So starting with Galilee. Galilee is um the northern region of Palestine. It's a district towards the southern end of the Roman province of Syria, and it's also the name of a seat. So name of a sea. District towards Southern End of Roman Province Syria. Next word is found. Greek word, can't pronounce it, so you'll see it. 
is H E U R I S K O with the accents. Discover, especially after searching. Or find by chance. Philip. Means horse loving. And, um, yep, that's just what that means. Horse loving. I thought that was funny when I looked up his name. We have Beth Sida. Which means house of fish. Name of two cities. On the shore. Of the sea. Of Galilee, Nathaniel All I'm going to say is he's mentioned as Bartholomew. So, found Philip Bethsaida Nathaniel. And lastly is the seats. Oh, the deceit is not the last word, but I wrote it down first. So for deceit, I'll just do that one now since I already wrote the name. Um, deceit, the Greek word is dolos, meaning guile, treachery, or bait to allure. So... Greek word dolos, guile, treachery, or bait to allure. Then we have Nazareth, Nazareth. Um, City of Galilee, where Jesus lived, before his ministry. I think my camera is going to cut off soon because I think it only records in 45 minute increments. So. So, starting off, we have um, Galilee, which is the name of a sea, and it's also the district towards the southern end of the Roman province, Syria. We have found, which the Greek word I can't pronounce, but it means to discover, especially after searching, or to find by chance. Philip, which means horse-loving. Bethsaida, which means house of fish. It's also the name of two cities on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Um, Nathaniel, which is mentioned as Bartholomew, 
in the Synoptic Gospels. Um, so if you read Matthew, Mark, or Luke and you see the name Bartholomew, it is most likely Bartholomew and Nathaniel are the same. But in the Gospel of John, for some reason, they don't call him Bartholomew. They call him Nathaniel. So we have that. Stick that note here. And then lastly, we have deceit which the Greek word is dolos, which means guile, treachery, or bait to allure, and Nazareth, which is the city of Galilee where Jesus lived before his ministry. 30 minutes left, and we're going to tackle this last part. So, diving in, going to my notes now, for what verses is 43? Okay. So, he found Philip. I'm going to underline he found Philip. Now, this could have been, you know, by chance, but I feel like this was an intentional thing because Jesus really doesn't do anything by chance. I mean, when have you known God or Jesus to do anything by chance? So, um, Jesus came upon someone he wanted to follow, um, wanted to follow him. Hopefully that just made sense. Um, Jesus came across... A soul, I'll say a soul, he wanted to follow him. So I feel like this was like an, a personal invitation, um, a hand-picked kind of thing. I'm going to go now to where it says, said to him, follow me. So when he said to him, follow me, Jesus personally called Philip and he followed just as the other disciples had without hesitation, accepting the call. So this is a two parter. One, this was a personal invitation, a personal call for Philip to follow. And then the second thing is there was no hesitation on his end and he quickly accepted the call of um, Jesus. So. Okay, guys, so I just had to um, delete some stuff off the memory card. But um, like I said, we did said to, him, said to him, follow me. And I said that um, Jesus personally called and invited him, and he accepted without hesitation. Moving on to 44. I'm underlining the whole verse. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Keep in mind, Bethsaida, we did define Bethsaida is um it means the house of fish and it was this, the name of the two cities on the shore of the sea of galilee um what i thought was so profound from that particular verse Okay, so what I thought was profound was that um, a town of fishermen would become fishers of men. I thought it was like ironic, I guess, a play on the name.
Philip Fount Nathaniel. And I'm also going to underline, we have found him whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, the son of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So, Philip Fount Nathaniel. I probably should have wrote my notes on the back of the sheet first, but I can always just write them somewhere else. So, Philip Fount Nathaniel. Just as Andrew, he is now a fisher of men. The part that says we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. This is his testimony um, as a witness. Um, then we have Luke 16, 16. And then twenty four, twenty seven. So Luke sixteen, sixteen. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it. And then 24, 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So. Then the last part where it says Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, this speaks of the fulfillment of Jesus being a Nazarene. So, this speaks of the fulfillment of Jesus being. Nazarene and that's Matthews 223 and Luke 323 so Matthews 2 and 23 and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled that he would be called a Nazarene and Luke Three and twenty-three. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about thirty years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli. Heli, Heli. I don't know how to pronounce it, but um, that's that. Forty-six. Can anything good come out of Nazareth?
going to use this pretty Okay, so can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathaniel was immediately prejudiced because he assumed that the Messiah had to be from somewhere more fancy. This is a great example of seeing God use the least for his glory. So, Nathaniel... Being judgmental... Great example of God using the least for his glory. Going on to verse 47, Behold an Israelite indeed, whom there is no deceit. That whole verse. So behold an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Oh, that's too far over. Uh, basically, Jesus gives Nathaniel a compliment for being a proper Israelite. So behold an Israelite indeed whom there is no deceit. And again, deceit, as we defined, is um, guile, treachery, or uh, bait to allure. Sorry, I had to look at that again. So bait to allure. Um, so Jesus has given Nathaniel a compliment for being a proper Israelite. The cross references I have for that are Psalm 73 and 1, which says, Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Then we have 32 and 2, which says, Blessed is a man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Zephaniah, I think that's how you say that, Zephaniah. 3 and 13, which says, Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue, but they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. And lastly, Revelation 14 and 5. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. So, um, though Nathaniel got judgmental, there was no type of deceit in him. There was nothing um, treacherous about him. So Jesus was basically giving him a compliment because a lot of the Israelites, um, the Jews became Pharisees and, you know, they didn't really hold true to the law anymore, but I guess he did. So,
48. How do you know me? Um, I'm not going to write the note out for that, but basically in the printable that you have, I basically put that having never met Jesus, he was confused on how he knew him. Um, he was confused on how Jesus knew who he was, having never met Jesus a day in his life, and just finding out about Jesus. But Jesus clearly knew um, a lot about him within those few words of, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. I just received a text. Um, I'll answer that email in a second. So I'm going to go to, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And that's in verse 48. So basically, um... If you have a relationship with the Father, then the Son knows you more than he even... I'm sorry. If you have a relationship with the Father, the Father being God, then the Son knows you before he even sets eyes on you physically. This proves that Jesus is omniscient. Um, the reason being is because the fig tree back in that time um, when this was written was where the men would meditate on scripture and pray. So the fig tree was kind of like their secret place where they would go, meditate, read the word of God, and study. Um, and through Nathaniel's relationship with God, Jesus was able to see who he was because, again, Jesus is God and he's not God at the same time. So I'm going to box fig tree, actually, because that's a whole different point. So I box fig tree, I'm going to use gray and make my point for that after. But um, if you have a relationship with God, Then Jesus knows you. Proves that he And again, for the fig tree, um, was where So again, the fig tree was where they prayed and meditated on scripture, which was basically their secret place. And um, if you have a relationship with God, then Jesus knows you, and this proves that Jesus is omniscient. Moving on to 49. I'm going to underline where he says, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. I'm actually going to keep underlining so that I can just share my notes as I go. Um, going to 50, I said, I underlined because I said to you, I saw you under a fig tree. Do you believe? I'm also going to underline, you will see greater things than these. And then 51 is going to be a doozy. So truly, truly, I say to you. is one then I'm gonna underline you will see heaven open then I'm gonna underline the angels of God ascending and descending 
on the Son of Man. Okay, so I have all of that down, so now I'm just going to write out my notes so we can finish up. Okay, so this is verse 49 where it says, Rabbi, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. Basically, this is Nathaniel's testimony of Jesus. Um, Son of God described the unique relationship of Jesus to God. So. For verse 50, I underlined, um, oh, I didn't even finish my note, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, okay, so for verse 49, Nathaniel's testimony of Jesus and Son of God described the relationship of Jesus to God the Father. King of Israel. Described his status as the Messiah and King, and there's Zephaniah three fifteen. Zechariah nine and nine. Matthew 27, 11, and Matthew 27, 42, which I'm not going to read because running low on battery. <laughs> so, um, you can definitely check out these cross-references for yourself. Zephaniah 3, 15, Zechariah 9 and 9, Matthew 27, verses 11 and verse 42. Moving on to verse 50. Um, verse 50 when he says because I said to you I saw under the fig tree do you believe so um this is something that I think is important because it was as simple as Jesus saying something to him that now makes him have faith in who he is that's profound because a lot of people don't have faith in something that someone says and because he is christ if you take his word for what it is that means you have great faith so i think that's important so um
Nathaniel, and this note is not written on the actual printable. I don't know why I didn't write it, so I will be updating the printable um, before I put this video up. But Nathaniel If you guys hear drums, I apologize. My little brother is up, so he's working since he has to go perform this weekend with a celebrity. So, um, yeah. Nathaniel shows great faith by believing in what Jesus says. The next part in that verse says, you will see greater things than these. So, verse 50 again. This is a revelation. Um, give me a second. What did I write? Where is my note? Okay, so Nathaniel was amazed by what he already saw in Jesus, but Jesus promises that he will see more than what he calls amazing, much more beyond his own understanding. So, this is the promise. This is a promise. That they will see more than they could ever understand and I mean this reminds me actually of the time when um, Jesus walked past that I think it was a fig tree was it a fig tree that he had walked past and he saw that it bore no fruit so he told it to basically shrivel and die and when they had walked past that tree again it was basically dead that's something that um you know he did promise back in first john that they would see things that um were greater than just hearing him say stuff so my finger is itching <laughs> so moving on to the last verse which is verse 51 there are three parts to that so he starts off by saying truly truly i say to you I feel that anytime Jesus repeats the word truly, so whenever he says truly, truly, I say to you, I feel like this is an emphasis to um, the importance of what he's getting ready to speak. Even though everything he says out of his word, every word that he utters out of his mouth is divine and important, when he has to say truly, truly, I say to you, I feel like this is like, okay, Everything I said was important, but you really, really need to pay attention to this because this right here is going to be something that you really, really need to understand. That's how I feel because, I mean, he he says it often, but not often. So, this gives emphasis to importance of what he's about to say so then he goes on to say you will see heaven open this is basically proof once again of his deity and his divinity so Of his deity and divinity. Cross references are Matthew three sixteen and Luke three twenty one.
And then lastly, um, where it says the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. I'm going to write the note here. This connects to the visions of Old Testament, OT, Old Testament. From Jacob and Daniel. Jesus is the mediator. Between God and man, right? God and man. Genesis twenty-eight twelve. Daniel seven thirteen to fourteen. And I'm actually gonna read those cross references. Those two I will read. There we have it. Close my pens up. So, um, where it says the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This connects the visions of the Old Testament from Jacob and Daniel. And this basically tells us that Jesus is the mediator between um, God and man. I'm going to read Genesis 28:12 to you. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set upon on the set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were descending, I mean were ascending and descending on it. So that ladder would be Jesus being um, a mediator between God and man and the angels doing their work. Um, and then we have Daniel. Daniel 7, 13, and 14, which says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So Daniel's vision is all about Jesus. Um, it says there came one like a son of man. Jesus was born of man, but he was the son of God, which is why they call him son of man, son of God. Um, the ancient of days, I'm not sure what that means. I'm not even going to pretend to know. Um, there was just a message. Okay. Um, to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. So, you know, Jesus came. God gave him a kingdom. You know, he gave him dominion. He gave him all authority and power. So that was something I thought was crucial um, for that. But that's pretty much it. I'm going to stick these sticky notes where they can go. But we have finished chapter one, you guys. I am going to update the chapter one notes. Um, so by the time you see this video, I'm going to tell you to re-download the printable um, for chapter one notes. Re-download it because um, I'm going to edit them and add some stuff. Because I know I left some stuff. I'm, I'm looking through this now. But um, I'm just going to give you my thoughts. So basically, chapter one is a summation of the entire book of John. It shows us the main things um, for the reset I'm sorry, for the rest of the book. See, yeah, this is why I need to go back and edit. I put reset, but I meant to say rest of the book. Um, those things are basically the identity of the word, life, light, regeneration, grace, truth, and the revelation of God the Father and Jesus the Son. Um, packed with many verses, we get to see the glimpse of his deity and how he is still fully God, though he is fully man. The last few verses, which are verses 45 to 51, um, really shows us four ways in which a person can come to Jesus. First, you have Andrew. Um, Andrew came to Jesus because of the preaching of John the Baptist. Then you have a second way, which is through the witness. Peter came to Jesus because of the witness of his brother Andrew. The third way is from a direct call, 
And that basically means um, when Philip came to Jesus because Jesus told him to follow me, that was a direct call. And then the first, the fourth way is a personal encounter. Nathaniel came to Jesus as he overcame personal prejudices by a personal encounter with Jesus. So in John chapter 1, you see four ways people can come to, to, to Jesus. Through pre preaching, through the witness, through di a direct call, and through a personal encounter. Those are four different ways we can come to Christ. Um, also within those verses, verses 45 to 51, we see the four witnesses testifying to Jesus' identity. Um, the first one was John the Baptist. He testified that Jesus was eternal, that he was the anointed Holy Spirit, sorry, that he was anointed with the Holy Spirit, that he was the Lamb of God, and that he was the Son of God. Then you have Andrew, who comes and says that he is the Messiah, the Christ. You have Philip, who says that Jesus is the prophesied one from the Old Testament. And then you have Nathaniel, who calls him also Son of God, like John the Baptist, but also calls him the King of Israel. So, you really get a lot out of John chapter 1, which is, I'm, I'm actually happy we took this in four parts, um, because it's a lot, it's packed with a lot, and when you read through it the first time, you're probably just going to breeze through it and probably not understand, but it's when you actually take time to pull apart the verses and really dive deep, and I mean, I don't just get my notes off the top of my head, some of them are like a spiritual download where God will tell me things, but sometimes I do look up on, um, in my commentaries and my study Bibles, I do look up all the information that I uh, share with you guys and make sure that it's credible information and make sure that it is um, God-led information that I'm giving you guys. But uh, yeah, chapter one is really, really amazing. I really just like the idea that it shows four ways to come to Jesus and then shows the four witnesses that testify to his deity. But um, yeah, chapter one was packed with a lot of notes. Um, a lot of notes finally done with chapter one. So definitely, uh, again, go re-download those study notes because they're updated. And on Tuesday, what's Tuesday? I can't even tell. Let me look at my, uh, calendar. Tuesday is the 17th of July. So July 17th at 10 a.m. I will be going live in the Facebook group for the next session, which will be on chapter two. Um, chapter 2 is only 25 verses, so I'm hoping to complete all of chapter 2 in that lesson, I mean in that session. Um, but for those of you on YouTube who don't have Facebook or who don't have, um, don't go on Facebook, you will see chapter 2 on Friday, no, Thursday, sorry. So, the Tuesday live sessions that I do in the Facebook group, you guys see Thursday, and then everyone sees Friday's videos together. So, that is pretty much it. Thank you guys for watching this super long video. And um, if you have any comments, questions, concerns, you can always Facebook me, Instagram DM me, you can email me, um, you can just comment your questions down below and I'll answer them. I love interacting with you guys and really answering you guys' questions. But um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So yeah, go download the new notes or the updated notes and I'll see you guys later. Bye.